in my life lately, I've been brought into a realization of prayer. Prayer is a topic that has been in the forefront of my mind and in my heart. And it's because of some things that we're dealing with and going through in our life presently. In fact, the other day I was I was telling Debbie that I'd got into a um how many people have heard of George Mueller? Who's heard the name George Mueller? Okay. George Mueller was a, a mighty man of God, lived back in the 17, 1800s, about the same time as Charles Dickens. Um, but just a, just a real thin uh, overview, he came to the Lord and became a very strong, strong Christian in the Lord. One of the things that he did as a as a passion was he began after he got saved and went and and got other people saved the lord laid on his heart to begin to have a, a children's ministry of orphans and he began to he it was a time in england that he lived in england uh when the children were running the street. They said there was like 2,500 or just a lot of kids. They said it was just very many children and a lot of them were mother and fatherless because of plagues and other things that had happened. And so he had a heart to take care of them. But he read in the Bible where God could take care of them and didn't need any help from us. And so he basically decided that he was going to have a ministry where he wasn't going to tell you what he needed he was going to tell God and let God talk to you. And so he made a determination. And he, and he lived, ministered like 75. He was 92 when he died. But he lived 75 some odd years in the ministry for the Lord. Um, but he had thousands of orphanages across the land and in other nations. He was, and I forget the, the number, I'll murder the numbers, but it was in the thousands of, of kids that he would minister to. He would have stories where they would all set up with his children, and, and then he would, he would say, let's, let's pray and give thanks over this food, and, and the kids wouldn't have anything in front of them. And he'd say, well, let's pray, and let's just thank God, and he'd, he'd thank God for the food they were about to receive, and about that time there was a knock on the door. And come to find out that a milk truck had had busted an axle right out in front of their orphanage. And they couldn't do anything with the milk, so they just donated all the milk to the orphanage. And about that time, there was another knock on the door. They said, Lord, we can't just drink this. We now have to have something to eat. About that time, there was another knock. And it was the baker down the road. He said, last night, me and my wife were woken up about 3 o'clock in the morning. And God said, make bread. And so he made bread. And is it okay if we bring it on in here? There was account after account after account of how God provided for them miraculously. He said, we wouldn't tell anybody. They had another time when they needed about 20,000 pounds. And I was telling Debbie about this. And they just had to, they prayed for God to, to provide. And he said that was back then $20,000 back in the 1700s is like a million dollars now. And he said, I didn't have that the kind of, we sure didn't have the finances for it, but he said, I just, I said, Lord, we need this. And he said, not too long later, someone gave him a thousand pounds. He said, well, that's good, but that's not going to meet our $20,000 need. And then a little bit later, he got another 5,000. Well, that still doesn't meet the need. He said, Father, we still need more. It was a long story, but at the end of it, he had this one girl that was going to go to overseas. And she was, she was going to go over there and he had prayed for her because she was very rebellious and she didn't she didn't want to follow the Lord, but her and her her him and him and her brother prayed that God would change her heart, and God changed her heart. And one day he gets this box in the mail. It's a wooden box, and he thinks, well, I wonder what this is. What's in this? And on the on the top of it, it said, I won't need these toys of the world anymore. 
she came from a very wealthy family. And he thinks, well, what's the toys of this world? He opens it up. And inside of it, there's like rubies that are that big on this necklace. And he thinks, I'm going to go see how much this thing costs. He opens it, and it opens it a little further, and there's a whole diamond necklace in there. Before it was over, they had it was it was worth millions of dollars. But she was she basically went over into the mission field in India, and I don't need this anymore. So she gave it to the church. When they appraised it, it was worth who knows how much. But it, it just began to show me, and it began to spark my faith that God knows what we have need of. God knows the things that we're dealing with, and God wants us to come to Him. He doesn't need our help. So what we need to do is when we go to God, we need to go to Him in prayer because God is a God of prayer. And when we pray to Him, we pray to Him, the Bible says, in secret. We don't go and broadcast it to the whole world. Prayer is simply talking to God. Whenever you have a conversation, it's always a two-way conversation. I would pray and pray and pray in the past. And one day Debbie said, well, it's a two-way conversation. And I said, what do you mean? Well, she says, when you talk to God, does he ever talk back to you? And that was kind of a revelation to me. What, you're supposed to, he's supposed to answer? I thought it was just give him my laundry list and Roger over and out. No, it's a time of speaking to him. But then I think this is something that a lot of us do not realize is that God also is supposed to be speaking to us. And Jesus said that my sheep hear my voice and a stranger they will not follow. So there's a part of when God speaks to us that we do hear, even though many of us say, well, I don't hear God. We, we probably do because if you ever do something wrong, yeah, you hear a big time because you can't get past it. You can't get it out of your mind. It is on you. And so, yeah, we do hear God. I think a lot of times we don't recognize that we are hearing God and that we don't. We think he's not talking to us. That's just our mind. That's just whatever. And yet God is communicating. And if we exercise that and learn to hear that voice, we can we can follow the the urging and the dictates of the Lord. Amen? In the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 5, Jesus told them, he said, and when you pray, he said, you shall not be like the hypocrites. And I thought, what's the difference in a hypocrite's prayer and our prayer? The main thing is motive. Hypocrites pray just like we do, but they differ in the motive. They want to be seen by others, and so they'll stand up in church or stand on a street corner or in the marketplace to be seen by men. And Jesus said, they'll receive, that's all the the reward that they'll receive is being heard and being seen. And we can't, we can't allow our prayers to become hypocritical prayers. Jesus said in verse 6, but you, on the other hand, when you pray, here's how he tells us to do it. He says, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your God who is in secret, and your God, your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you openly. Do you know that nothing is hidden from God? The Bible says in Luke chapter 8, verse 17, For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and will come to light. He also said, "When And when you pray, verse 7, do not use vain repetition as the heathen do. We're not doing mantras. We're not chanting before the Lord. It's not rote. He says, don't be like the heathen. When you're, talk, when you're coming to talk to me, talk to me. Just like Vicky and I would talk, or like Ron and I would talk, talk and receive, talk and hear, converse back and forth. 
Let it not be vain repetition, for they think they will be heard for their many words. He said, therefore, verse 8, do not be like them, for your father knows the things that you need before you ask him. Do you know that before you come to God and say, look, Lord, here's what I need. He already knows what you're there for. It's not any news to him. You're just bringing it to him, and he's, he wants you to bring it to him. Even though he knows it, he still wants us to ask him for it. He said, in this manner pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then he says, give us this day our daily bread. And we see here where we're asking for the things that we need. Provide for our needs, Lord. God knows what we need before we ask him, but he instructs us to ask him. He said then, forgive us our debts, forgive us our sins, even as we forgive those that have sinned against us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. We end by saying, Lord, the kingdom is yours. All power is yours. All the glory is yours. And you will be glorified forever. We praise your greatness. Verse 14, but if you do not forgive men their sins, their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And I've come across this one with some, with some people that I've talked to who someone has done them wrong, whether it's a sister, whether it's a church, whether it was a, a pastor, whether it's a friend that betrayed them, whatever it is. And years later, they're still nursing that grudge and they can't let it go. And I thought, you know, when we come to God, God says, you know, I've forgiven you so much. How is it that you can't forgive her for what she said, for what she did? How do you come to me needing stuff from me? I've forgiven you, and yet you can't extend that same grace to your fellow man. We continue to want to keep them bound because somehow if we release them, they'll forget how much they hurt us. Okay? I don't know why it is, but we, when we've been wrong, when we've been hurt, we want them to say they're sorry. We want them to feel our pain, whatever it may be, fill in the blanks. But the honest thing about it is that we cannot afford to hold men and women in hostage to, of unforgiveness. We have to forgive them. Our own salvation, I would, I would uh, say, is based on have we forgiven? Because God himself right here has said, if you don't forgive them, you'll not get forgiveness yourself. I don't think he was playing. So whenever we search our heart, we need to make sure that we keep short accounts. When someone wrongs us, and we will be wronged, we will be hurt, we will be, someone will run over our feelings. But it's for our own good that we need to say, Lord, I forgive them. I let it go. I may not want to, but I'm letting it go. And if you have to let it go twice or thrice, keep letting it go until it's not part of your consciousness where you're continuing to bring it up. Luke chapter 11, verse 15, he says, in talking to God, about God, he says, And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. He says, I have nothing in the house. And here he is. Somebody give me some food. I've got to feed him. And verse 7, and he will answer you from within the house and said, do not trouble me. The door is shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and I cannot give to you. So that's, that's it. it's not happening. I'm already in bed. Leave me alone. Okay. Now, 
does, does the friend go away? No, he stays at the door and goes, nope, you're going to answer. And I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he's a friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many loaves of bread as he needs. And I put in my margin, persistence is praised. Jesus praised being persistent. And if you think about it, there's another verse that talks about the, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. When you go to God and you're, you know, you're sweating drops of blood, that's the kind of prayer that God hears. Now, don't be, don't be manufacturing tears on purpose, okay? But the thing is, somehow it, it, it ministers to God when we come in the intensity of our heart and we lay it all out there. He understands that. Verse 9, so I say to you, because of that, Jesus said, so I say to you, and he tells us what to do, ask God, and he'll give it to you. Seek from God, and you will find. Knock on the door. Lord, let me in, let me in, whatever it may be. Let me into this opportunity. Let me into this place of blessing. When you knock, that God will open this to you. God says, you knock, I'll open. You call, I'll answer. You speak, I'll listen. But it, it's, it's instigated, it's, it's, initial, it's instigated, initiated by us as we say, Lord, here's what I need. And he's saying, come to me and see if I don't open my hands to you. But he wants us to ask him, okay? Verse 10, for everyone, this is Jesus talking, and he's inspired by God. So Jesus is making you a, uh, a promise. Everyone who asks receives. That's pretty much blank check to me. When I need something from God, I can go to him. He said, come ask me what you need, and let's talk about it. And you're not going to break God, okay? He's got more money than fill in the blanks. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. We can go to God and say, Lord, you said if I wanted to get into this, and if I wanted to go here, and it's an opportunity that you can give me, you said if I'd come to you and ask for it, you'd open the door for me. I'm asking. God wants us to take him at his word. If a son, verse 11, if a son asks for bread from a father, if your son says, Daddy, can I have a piece of bread? Are you going to give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, you know, I want some Van de Camp's fish sticks for dinner. What are you going to do? You're going to put a serpent on his plate? And of course, we're all going, uh, no. If he asks for an egg, Dad, I want two eggs over easy with a side of bacon. Is he going to put a scorpion on your plate? No. So when we come to God and we ask for something that's good, when we come to God, we're his child. He's making a point here. He says, think about it, guys. If you can be kind, if you can be nice, if you can be responsive to the needs of your son, am I like the big bad guy in the world that I'm not going to be at least as nice as you guys are? And you're carnal. You're human. This is the point he's making. If you then, verse 13, being evil, if you being carnal, if you being made of dirt and dust, sons of Adam, know how to give good stuff to your kids. If they want a racer, a four-wheel drive racer to go across your lawn, are you going to say no? Go sit in the corner and read a book. You're going to say, here, there's one right there. Put some gas in it and go. We want to do good things for our children. God is the same way. He's making a point. He says, guys, I'm nicer than the best of you guys are, is what he's trying to say. 
So if you guys will do it, how much more can you expect to get it from a heavenly father? I think we too often have heard about God being the big guy in the sky that's going to pop us on the head and try to undermine us and see if he can put cancer on us. And I mean, it's all a negative press, and God's like, I'm a good God. All good things and perfect things come down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. If you then, being evil, verse 13, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He uses an example. Lord, I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. You know, and then you, we hear some people saying, well, no, some, he, some he'll fill, some he won't. Throw that out the window. If we say, God, I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, will he fill us? Amen. Okay. James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. Now, you know, in our own lives, we have times where this is broken. That's broken. This ain't working. That's not right. And we're kind of taped. Our, our life seems like it's taped together with duct tape and bailing wire, as they say. And we're like, boy, I don't know about blessings, but it, it must have, I must have missed the boat on that deal. James says, my brothers, my Christian brothers, he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And what he's talking about is just things that are Things that we deal with that are not bueno. We've got a, situa a plumbing situation at our house. This is one thing that I've been dealing with. I won't go into it. But it's something that I'm like, Lord, the plumbing issue. I mean, I'm sitting in the doxology and I'm going, Lord, don't forget the plumbing. You know, you know, if, if you guys ever had some issues in your life, you know what I'm talking about. Lord, don't forget, Friday's, Friday's the rent's due. Okay? So, I mean, I don't think that's unbiblical. So... My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And I thought, you know what? All of us he-men, men that want to be our weight, weight lifting, when you want to get bigger and stronger, what do you do? Do you put less weight? Do you, do you, do you lift the ladies' barbells? Or do you get the ones that you see on, you know, where it looks like you're lifting a train? What is it doing? It's breaking down your old, soft, weak muscles, and then they repair back, and it builds muscle, and then you break it down again. Seems awful ignorant, and yet it works. They say no pain, no gain, right? Of course, I had a buddy that would say no pain, no pain, you know, so I don't think he understood how that worked. But the idea is, and that's why when you see these guys where they just worked out and they're wiped out, and they're just hurting all over, they know that they've just had a good workout, which means that next week I'm going to build back and I'm going to get stronger. Use that same analogy when in this verse. When you increase the weights, when you go from 90 to 110 and then 150 and then 175 and you get up to 200 pounds, and guys will do this. I'm up to 275 now. I can bench the more you put on there, the stronger you've got to be to lift it. The testing of your faith produces patience. None of us wants patience as, as an attribute that we're looking for on purpose. Now, it may develop in us, but so what he's saying is, is don't resist the hard things. When things are hard, be joyful in it because what it's doing is it's actually exercising your spiritual muscle. It's hurting you to have to be smile when you're ready to hurt somebody and when you're just going, just peace. The testing of your faith produces patience. Then he says, but let patience have its perfect work, verse 4, so that you can be perfect and complete, wanting nothing. Do you know, I've, 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 I've seen people in my life, people like Elizabeth Elliot, that was through Gates of Splendor, where her husband and her, they went to the mission field to talk to the Alka Indians, who were the 
headhunters down in Brazil would actually kill people and eat them. They were, it was not good. But they were going to carry the gospel to them. And so they landed their, they landed their plane on the beach. And before it was over, the natives got scared and they filled them with arrows to where they died. Okay, so that was back in the 60s. It was very famous. The whole world heard about it. These missionaries had gone to the field and, and they'd been killed for their... Long story short, Elizabeth has a daughter and her and her daughter later on, years later, go back to that same village, minister to those same people and win the whole bunch. Was it called? What was it? End of Spear. What was it called the the movie that Mardell's made? End of Spear. Anyway, but today, when you go out and, and you listen to the radio station, you'll hear a lady named Elizabeth Elliot, who was Jim Elliot's wife. The 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 wife. She's the one that actually won all those people with the love of her heart. She went back over, and she won those people. But when you listen to her talk, she has such a grace. It's like nothing rocks her world. She just talks easy, and she's been through hell. Corey Ten Boom, when you talk to her, she's been through Auschwitz. She's been through Dachau. She's, her sister was killed in the, in, in the infernos over there. And then later on, she got out, and she had a huge ministry to the whole world. But when you listen to her speak, it's such with calmness and such patience. And it's, it's the grace that's built into her. You don't come by that going down and picking it up at the store. That comes from it's, it's being seasoned. It's, it's from having your boat try to be rocked for years, and yet you've, you develop a trust and a faith in God that nothing can shake. And then it's like, like you would say, no matter what happens, I'm going to stay steady. I don't care what's going on. I'm not going to get worked up about it. And that's a grace that is built into you as you let that, those issues work with you. They, they minister patience to your heart and you become more and more of a more godlike because he doesn't, he, his boat doesn't get rocked at all. Perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And I wrote here in my margin, we can be joyful in trials knowing that the testing of our faith is building patience within our inner man. We are being tried. It's hard. We pray and it looks like nothing's happening. Don't stop. Don't quit. Don't turn back. Keep pressing on. Keep our eyes on God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11 through 13 says, Hebrews 11, 12, 11, Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but grievous. You know, when you're getting your beaten, it's not a happy time, okay? And when you're going through life's beating, it's not a happy time, okay? It's hard to go, yay, this is so wonderful, I'm getting this not beat out of me. No. But we are encouraged to be joyful even in, even when there's none of this in the cupboard or even when there's no gas in the car or even when that thing got flat tire one more time and it's like, I don't need that. Those are trials. Those are just real things and we all go through them. There's not one of us in here that doesn't have things that break or goes on and we... We have a carnal tendency to want to grumble, moan, oh, woe is me. And yet those are the times that he's saying, use those times like more weight to build your inner strength. Just say, no, I'm going to chill out. I'm going to thank God in all things. I'm not going to freak out. Okay. Nevertheless, okay, now no chastening seems to be joyous for the present, but grievous or painful. Nevertheless, however, here's the however, afterward, after the trial, it yields or it produces, it's like a tree would yield apples, your tree will yield a peaceable fruit of righteousness 
you're going to start popping out peaceable, righteous fruit. To those who are exercised thereby. If you don't, if you're exercised by it, means if, if you let it have its work in you, instead of resisting it and getting all mad about it and kicking the cat, okay, being exercised by it means letting it have its perfect work in you. You begin to exude grace under, under trouble, fruit of righteousness in a dark, dreary world. Wherefore, verse 12, lift up the hands that hang down. He said, because of that, wherefore, which is why, lift up your hands that hang down. Strengthen your little feeble knees. Stand up straight, boy. Get, come on, let's go. Verse, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. He says, don't give up. Get up off that ground. Pull up your drawers. Come on. We can do this. Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 14. Paul said this, and we think Paul. Paul wrote roughly two-thirds of the New Testament. So if anyone was a, uh, an example of who would be living right, who would have all their self together, we would think, well, Paul surely would. I mean, he wrote the stuff. Surely he would. But Paul, whenever he was communicating his needs to the Philippian people, he said, of course, and this, and this was in re- reference to a need that he had. They needed finances. They needed to for the ministry. He says, and I'm not saying this because I'm, I'm speaking in regards to a need. He says, because I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. No matter what's going on around you, you can still be content. It doesn't have to rock your world. It doesn't have to ruin your day. He said, I've learned to be content. Verse 12, I know how to be abased, which in English means I know how to hit the ground and and not have anything in the cupboards. I know how to bound. I just won the lottery. Okay? Both sides, when things are going great, when things are, when it's all breaking loose around us, I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And here's how he says he does it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If you go to Christ for your strength in times of hardship, that's where your strength will come. Instead of going rah, 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 and totally missing the blessing, go to Jesus and go, Jesus, I need your help right now in a big way. Okay? That'll preach. All right. Verse 14. Nevertheless, he, he adds his addendum. He says, nevertheless, you did well that you shared with me in my distress. In other words, thanks for the offering. That's <laughs> what that means in English. Okay. James chapter 1, verses, verse 5 to 8. You know, a lot of times we lack direction in life. We're like, you know what, if I, if I stay here in town and I work here, you know, I'll, I'll make so much. But what if I went over to a different state and if I did this? Or what if I married her? Or what if I, what if I did this over here? We don't know. And so our life is a continual series of choices. Are we going here? Are we going there? Are we going to Walmart? Are we going to stay at the house and order it out? You know, it's wisdom. Who knows what to do? And we're not supposed to be presumptuous to say, we'll go into this city and we'll make a ton of money and buy and sell. And he said, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Ask the Iranian president who should not have got on that helicopter. Okay. We do not know the end from the beginning. God could have told him, this is not going to be a good day in your life. James 1, 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, God says, let him come and ask of God, who will give to all liberally. Liberally means without holding back and without reproach. He won't say, you again? Would you ever learn anything? Now, a father of the world might say, dummy, but that's that doesn't minister to anybody, by the way. <laughs> but God will never do you that way. He said he will not reproach you, which means you can quit 
being scared, come out of the closet and just walk up there and talk to him. Liberally and without reproach, and it will be given him. There's that will be given. We need to start asking for some more stuff, sister. It will be given him. Verse 6. But let him ask in faith. When you go to God, you got to ask in faith. You don't come in and say, oh, God, I'm so unworthy and so washed up and all this. And God, you know I didn't do this. And, oh, God. Stop that. If you've for, asked for forgiveness, if it's under the blood, it's over. You need to get past it because he has. Okay? He said, let him ask faith, no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Maybe God will, no, I bet he won't. I've been asking for, uh, no, maybe I'll, no, I bet he won't. I bet he'll just. No more wishy-washy praying. Go to God, say, God, here's what I need. I got to have $400 by Friday because that's the rent or we're out. That's what it is. You're praying to God who has the resources, and if you didn't, if you had the resources, you probably wouldn't go, wouldn't be asking him. You'd say, "I'll just take that four hundred out of the bank, and I'll." But when you're in a walk of faith, you don't see the provision. You're asking and hoping that He hears and that He will provide, and He does. But the fact that He provides when you knew that nobody else in the world knew your situation shows you there's a God in heaven. They say, Calvin, that God doesn't exist. It's just all we just evolved out of apes. And you're like, you can believe that. I've been here too long. I've had, I've been through too much and God has come through too many times. Wouldn't you say that, Laura? Has God through come through some times for you? Like all the time, every day? Okay. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's un, he's unstable. He's double-minded, unstable in all of his ways. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Who would that be? Jesus, who has passed through the heavens. I thought this was interesting. In order to get to the heaven, you have to pass through the heavens. That'll preach. That's true. He passed through the heavens to get to where he's sitting at the right hand of God. And if you think about it, for a correlating scripture on that, John said he went to the third heaven, or Paul. Paul said he went to the third heaven. So if there's one, two, three, the third one's the top one, by the way. That's the top floor. Who passed through the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Let us hold steady. Let us stay strong. Let us not waffle. Let us not waver. Verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Do you know that Jesus had things that went wrong? Jesus had time he came up short. Jesus had, here it says right here, if we think, well, that was Jesus. He never had a problem in his life. Wrong. He said that we don't have a high priest who can't relate to us. He was in all points tempted as we are. He went through the same stuff as we do. Yet, he didn't sin. So he was steady. He was stable. He was steadfast. Verse 16. Let us therefore, because of that, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, which means let us boldly come before God's throne that we may obtain mercy. We may not deserve what we're asking for. In fact, we probably don't. Do we, that we may obtain mercy, that we might find grace. Grace is when you don't deserve it and you get it anyway. We're saying, Lord, I come before your throne of mercy, your throne of grace. I need you to help me in my time of need. And God says, okay, come boldly.
and Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12. It says, looking unto Jesus, who's the author, which means that he wrote the book, and he's the finisher. He puts, he puts the amen and the appendix in the back. He's the one that's got us covered front to back. He's the, the author and finisher of our faith for the joy that was set before him. They're saying, think about Jesus for the joy that was set before him. And that would be you and I. When he was on the cross, he saw Calvin. He saw me. He saw Connie. He saw Mama. He saw Laura. He saw Miss Ann. He saw us, and for the joy that someday we would be saved and we would go on to glory, he endured the cross. He despised the shame. I know I'm up here naked, but whatever. I'm not coming down off this cross. It was not an easy thing to do. He despised the shame. And because of that, he is set down at the right hand of God at this moment and forevermore will be there. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.